Jazakallah khair, and thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, I see some of you are way at the back. You might want to come forward. I spit when I talk sometimes when I get excited, but you'll, you'll be far enough away that I won't hit you. You'll be okay, inshallah. And um, why are we here today? We're here to talk about simplicity and, uh, and the arts. How many of you were with Sister Roxana Khan in the masjid a few moments ago? Wonderful. Excellent. Um, Roxana was talking a little bit about her work as a writer and uh, an artist. And, uh, and I will endeavor to do the same this morning a little bit. But not so much about, about just the art as for me one of the most inspirational aspects of why I, I write. And, and, um, and that is this quest for simplicity in faith and in life and in artistic expression. Um, let me gather my thoughts for a moment. The, the, the term simplicity and simple living, phrases like this that you hear, are very popular in our time. They're kind of up there on the list with natural foods and uh, all those brown bag packaged, you know, potato chips that you get and things that, you know, appear to be natural and organic. And in our, in our world and in our time here in North America, this is big business to talk about simplicity. And uh, you can make a lot of money off of talking about simplicity. And a lot of people, I think, who are seeking simplicity in their lives are spending a lot of money to seek simplicity, ironically. And um, that's something I don't understand. And as I, as I speak to you this morning, just from my heart about my own experiences uh, as an artist and as a Muslim, and as someone who really is seeking a lot of simplicity in his life, and as the title of the, the talk this morning is Struggling for Simplicity, I want you to keep in mind those ideas about uh, people who are spending a lot of money for simplicity. I have a dear friend of mine, we were chatting recently, we were talking about trying to eat more healthy and live more organically, and he just shook his head and said, man, I'll, I'll only be able to do that when I'm wealthy and I can afford to eat better, then I'll afford to eat better. And I think a lot of us might feel that. When you go to the grocery store and you see the the natural food aisles, or you see clothing that's made out of, you know, hemp or whatever natural fibers you want to find. They're always double the price, and we, we might feel that, you know, how are we supposed to live better if we can't afford to live better? And I think we've been bullied into that. That's my personal opinion, is that we've been bullied into that, because around the world, outside of our own little bubble of North America that we live in, on the other countries and, and, and the other billions of people on this planet, they're living simply because they have to live simply because they, they don't have any access to what we've got. Uh, my wife and I, we live in Pakistan. We've been there for about three years. We've just recently resettled back in Ontario. And having an opportunity to live in northern Pakistan in a semi-rural environment, we're in a city, but we're a very small city, Abbottabad, which is, you know, within 10 minutes you can be out into the villages. And it's very rustic. Your families, anybody whose families here might come from Pakistan, um, you might spend time in Lahore or Karachi or Islamabad. When you get out of those hubs of, of, of the city life and the urban life, immediately when you get out of Islamabad, you start to see simple living because this is the only way. There's no garbage collection, right? They don't come around with a truck and collect your garbage. There's no... Um, uh, the water, you know, only comes through for about 15 minutes in the morning into the well. And, and then you have to pump that water up to your, to your reservoir on the roof. And if your pump's not working, you've got to spend the day getting that pump working or you won't have water. And if the city municipal uh, you know, cantonment doesn't bring that water through to you, you'll, you might go through four days without any fresh water coming through. So you learn not to crank the tap on when you're making your wudu and have these huge ritual ablutions that are completely against the sunnah of the, of the Sahaba and the Prophet There's no uh, electricity. The bijli is gone for six, eight, ten hours a day. And you make do. You live simply without it. You realize you don't need the electricity um, because life has to carry on. And having the opportunity to live in an environment like that with my family was a wonderful eye-opener for me. Because my struggle for simplicity 
started when I was very, very young. And I'm not sure where you're coming from as people who've chosen to be here first thing in the morning, whether you came because you wanted to hear about simplicity, whether you wanted to hear about art, or whether you wanted to hear me sing, which I'm not going to do this morning. But I want to try and put them all together for you. I want to try and give you a bit of a history as to why I ended up being here right on, on this platform right now and sharing these words with you, why I write the songs that I write, why I choose to live without a cell phone, why I choose to live in Pakistan, why I enjoy having you know, eight hours with no electricity during the day when I'm there, why it is I grow my own vegetables and try to farm my own bees, and why it is I like to sew my own clothes, and why it is I am not buying any new clothes for the next 10 years. I want to explain some of these things to you and, and the reasons why and how they affect my art. I want to explain to you why I don't make music videos, why people say, we don't see your videos. Where do we find your CDs? Well, CDs are made of plastic, and I don't particularly want to manufacture those anymore because it just puts too much plastic in the world. And I don't make music videos because there are too many starving children in this world, and one music video costs $40,000 usually to make. And there's a lot of better things that I can do with my time and my money than make music videos when uh, there's other things uh, that are more pressing. The struggle for simplicity in my life is the struggle to go against how I was even raised in North America. When I was a young boy, my parents used to take me out uh, my sisters and I, we would go for many drives in the countryside, living in Kitchener-Waterloo, if you've been down that way. Uh, it's only an hour away. There's a very large Mennonite community there, and we would often see the Amish, or the Mennonite, uh, Old Order Mennonites families in their buggies and uh, in their very simple clothes. So we learned from a very young age that this was a very important community in our, in our a very important um, group of people within our community who were, according to their fiqh and their jurisprudence were living in a way which they felt was much more simple um, so that they could focus more on the earth than upon each other in their communities. And that had a powerful impact on me, seeing that. Um, it also helped me to realize that the interpretations of faith that my family had growing up in a Catholic school and in a Catholic family were not the only paradigm. That there are other people in the world that, that interpret faith and God and life and the lives of the prophets in different ways, and that's very important because we each have to find that path that feels true to who we are. And as a young man, I was very impacted by being in nature. I wasn't very good in school, and when I was in school, I remember just enjoying looking out of the window and seeing the poplar trees and the clouds and being outside, the freedom that I felt with that. And when you look at schools like this, you know, it's wonderful that we have schools for children, naturally, but the schools and the education that we have in the world were started at a time during the Industrial Revolution, back over 100, 150 years ago, when the discussion was held in Germany about what the purpose of education was. Is the purpose of education to impart information, or is the purpose of education to inspire people towards greater thought? And those people who felt that education was about imparting information to create individuals who would be best able to contribute to the machine of society, they won out. And that's why we have schools today that have very few windows. In fact, many of our high schools, you'll note, the classrooms are on the inside of the building and the windows are in the hallways. So that the youth are sitting in these boxes, not even able to see the outdoors. We used to have a 15-minute break in the morning and a 15-minute break in the afternoon, rain or shine, wind or snow, where we would go outside and play and get wet and feel the elements upon us. And now children have these short little nutrition breaks where they can drink their boxed juices and eat their cold cuts and everything else that comes out of a plastic bag for 25 minutes in the morning and 25 minutes or 40 minutes in the afternoon. And we've got them in the box the rest of the time. We've got children that don't know what a, what a pickle is. You know, they think pickles grow on trees. They don't realize that it's a baby cucumber that's been put in vinegar. We've got people that, you know, and children that, that, don't, that have never seen a cow. They've never seen a, uh, they can't identify the sounds of birds, much less imitate those birds and try and, and communicate with them. We, we live in a very different world. And as a child, I loved to be outdoors because that's where I felt the most freedom. This freedom to be in an environment where you can feel for a change. We don't have to put up your hand to go to the bathroom or put up your hand to say something. I mean, in these strange environments that we create and we put children in. My grandfather, great-grandfather, had a farm as well, and there was a lot of fond memories of visiting his farm, jumping in the hay, being outside with bugs. And as I got older, I started to realize and look around the world and begin to ask questions, you know? 
what were the things that were man-made and what were the things that were natural, that were real. And the more I would look around, the more I began to see, and you can do it yourselves. You needn't go any further than looking around a room like this. If you looked around this room for 30 seconds, could you find one thing in this room that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created other than you and I as human beings? And even you and I are garmented in our polyester clothes and our polyfibers. There's no wood in this room other than maybe this, but in fact, this isn't even wood because if I took my pocket knife out and I cracked this edging off, you'd find out that this is actually made of sawdust and glue. It's just made to look like wood, so it looks fancy. This isn't wood. There's very little in our environments that are, we've, we've got this concrete, we've got these walls around us, there's not even any light coming in. These are artificial lights shining on me. This is our world, right? And I didn't want to be a part of that world. I wanted something more natural for my life. And I began to look spiritually towards different scriptures and, um, and to find out that spiritual purpose. And when I came to discover the Quran, one of the things that struck me the most was Surah Al-Nahl. When you look in the Quran and you read how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly talking about the signs of Allah, the signs of God. Now the Quran in and of itself, each verse of the Quran, we call an ayah uh, or a verse, it actually means a sign. But the signs of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consistently reminds us within the Quran that these signs of the Quran are the minor signs. These are the signs that are constantly pointing us towards the major signs of God's wonder and beauty and majesty, which are the signs of creation. And one of the beautiful things that I've noticed in the Quran, and I noticed this very young when I was only about 19 or 20 years old, is that whenever Allah refers to the signs of creation, there are always two elements to those signs. There's the functional, practical element, and there's the aesthetic and beautiful element. This idea of, of a purpose and a divine purpose. And in, in our faith, we can talk about the two elements of the esoteric and the exoteric. The esoteric being that spiritual um, or vertical connection to God, and the exoteric being the, the, the body and what, what is, you know, the, how we dress ourselves as a Muslim, right? You know, or, or as a, a person of belief. So when you look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, when Allah talks about the cattle, that look at the cattle that you have that you lead out into the pastures in the morning and you bring them back in the evening and they are your, your source of food, they are your source of milk, they are your source of sustenance and they're beautiful. There's a reference to these, these creatures, these, these, these uh, animals as being beautiful. When Allah talks about the fields, and, and says that we have made for you the fields and the meadows and, and they spread out like carpets, you know? And when you see around the world folk art, the making of rugs, right? Because people used to have earthen floors and so they would put a rug over top of the earth so that it would keep the dust down in the homes and they would make those rugs floral and beautiful. They would, so that in their homes, it was as if they had brought that pasture and that beauty of God's creation into their home to cover the dirt for their, for their homes. This is why we have the beautiful carpets that we see from Persia and Afghanistan and Central and South America. Because Allah has said in the Quran, we've created these fields and we've made them like, like, like rugs, like, car, like carpets for you. The stars, Allah says, look at the stars and, and, and see the beautiful luster of the stars. We have placed them in the sky like lamps, it says in the Quran. But they also guide you. They guide you when you're, when you're traveling. So you can use these stars for your orientation, but you can also just lay back and marvel at their beauty, right? Your clothing. Allah says in the Quran, you have your clothing which protects you, your garments which protect you, but they are also your source of adornment to beautify yourself. And even the companions, it's narrated that the companions of Muhammad, peace be upon him, came to him and said, you know, we like when we have nice clothes to wear. Is that wrong? And he, his retort to them was no, that Allah is the creator of beauty, so beautify yourselves. And one of the things that the prophets, Muhammad peace be upon him, was noted for really enjoying was even atar, the smell of perfume, natural perfume and natural oil essences that were, were beautiful to him. So adorn yourself with these beautiful clothes. Our bodies are beautiful. Allah says you have been created. We've made you all different and unique and made you beautiful. You see something beautiful, what, now what, what do we do? We see someone beautiful and we go, Allah. 
Astaghfirullah, forgive me for what? Forgive me for seeing something beautiful. So you say, MashaAllah, people are beautiful. Get over it, people. <laughs> you know, how are we going to love each other and value each other's worth if we're looking at each other as if we're walking sins? We're the ones that should be asking Allah for forgiveness. If we've turned that beauty into something which is sexual for us, then that's our own issue. It's not the sister's fault for being beautiful. It's not the brother's fault for being beautiful. It's Allah's fault that they're beautiful. So don't, you know, turn it against the person because Allah has said, you're beautiful. The Quran as a, as a recitation and Allah says, when you recite it, recite it and make it beautiful. So beauty is a wonderful thing for us to fill our world with. But all of these things Allah has listed are natural things that Allah has created. Some of them are overt, the trees that are before us, the sun, the sky, the earth. Other, other things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, the coral and the rubies. Travel through the world and see the coral and the rubies. Now, coral is in the ocean, is in the water. If you want to see the beauty of Allah's creation or adorn yourself with coral, which would I advise you not do because it's a very endangered thing right now, but it's something you have to dive for. You have to give up your breathing to be able to find that beauty, that simple beauty, that natural beauty that Allah has created. If you expect to find that simple beauty in your life, then you have to give up one of the most important things which you need to survive, which is the oxygen that you breathe. And if you're not ready to give up that oxygen, you will never see that sign of Allah's creation. And rubies, you know, that have to be mined, that you find them within the rock. You need to work to find those simple beauties that Allah has created. And if you're not ready to work for it, you won't be able to extract that gem. And it'll just be a rock in a wall somewhere of stone. And so when it comes to our own lives, when it comes to trying to find some simplicity, if any of you are like me and you live here in an urban environment and you, and you just feel like life is too fast, and it's too concrete, and it's too much plastic, and it's too hard, and I can't find my faith, and I don't know who I am anymore, and I'm bullied into what cereal I need to buy, and I'm bullied into what fast food restaurant I'm gonna go to, and I'm bullied into what suburban spiritual environment I'm gonna be in. We have Mick Islam, Mick Christianity, Mick Judaism. Our religious communities in our mosques are sometimes, no, you know, just as uncomfortable environments as McDonald's, for crying out loud because we're taught that our faith is gonna be a combo pack. Which religion do you want? I want Islam. Okay, which one? Combo one, combo two, combo three. You're gonna do Tabliki style, you're gonna do it Salafi style, you're gonna do it Sufi style. Come on, people, that's not natural. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't created these, these divisions we have. Lettuce grows in a garden. It's easy to grow and it's easy to pick if you're ready to put the effort into it. If you're not, then you're going to end up going to McDonald's and you've got to put up with whatever combo they're going to give you. If trying to find Allah is too hard for you to find in the masjid, as it's been for me many times, there's been a few times when I've walked out of a khutbah because I've heard hate about homosexuality or I've heard hate about other faith communities spewed on the mimbar, and I've said, enough of this. You go somewhere where Allah is, you'll find that in the natural environments. But it takes work. It takes hunting. For that simplicity. Living simply is different from living simplistically. These things that are simplistic are things that are very basic and they're not, they're not, there's not a lot of thought in them. Living simply is a choice that we make and it's not an easy choice. Living simply is not synonymous with an easy life because like the coral that you have to dive for and have to give up your oxygen to see and find, or like the ruby that you need to mine for and dig for to see the beauty of that ruby that Allah has created. If you, we want simplicity in our own lives, we have to be ready to do something different, shift our paradigm. We talk about wanting to live simple lives, and in the middle of our conversation, we start going like this. Where's the simple living in that? We need to find ways to stop doing the things which are interrupting our simplicity. And that will be different for each one of us. For my own self, I know my propensity to um, television and music. I've, as a kid, I grew up with media and I grew up with music and, and I've known all too well, and as a musician, I know all too well how those things can, clear, uh, can, can take away your mind from a, a goal and a focus. And it's important for us to learn how to balance in our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ar-Rahman, the very beginning of the surah, in the chapter of the merciful, 
God says, we have created this whole universe in balance. So do not lose the balance. And to me, this is a very, very important, probably one of the most important verses in the Quran to me is this verse, that the universe has been created in balance. So do not lose the balance. If I took a ruler and I balanced it on my finger in front of you right here, I could probably do it. Try this at home sometime. Take a ruler and just balance it on your finger. You find the middle way and you balance. Now everyone talks about our faith. Oh, our faith is the middle path, the middle way. It's very difficult to keep a ruler balanced on your finger, but you could probably master it. Now that's great if you want to live in a bubble. You want to live in your masjid all the time. You want to live in your school all the time and you want to just sit there and go, there, I'm a good Muslim. I'm balancing my, my life. But that's not real. We live in the world with other people. We share this world as the prophet, peace be upon him, did. We share this world with people of other faiths and cultures and lifestyles. And we need to interact together because we're all the same species and we're all equal. God's created us all equal because God says everything in the earth has been created in balance, right? And if God has created all of the humanity, then by default, we are all equal. We've got to, it's up to us to keep that balance. So take that ruler on your finger and see if you can walk all the way to the front door of your house without letting it fall. It's very difficult, especially if you have stairs in your house, because in our lives, things go up and down. And when things go up or down, it's harder to keep that balance. But eventually, you may be able to master carrying that ruler on the tip of your finger up the stairs and down the stairs and to your front door. Maybe you'll even be able to master opening that door and going outside with the ruler on your finger. But then there's the other aspects of Allah's creation, the wind and the rain and the snow and the people. Try and carry that, that ruler on the tip of your finger on a windy day outside or on a snowy day or on a rainy day. Try and see if you can walk through the Eaton Center in downtown Toronto with that ruler on your finger and maintain that balance. It's very, very hard because there's a lot of things to see and a lot of people walking around and passing us. So we have to be very diligent constantly about how to maintain that balance and the simplicity in our lives. Um, a few things that I've tried to do in my life is to start with my own home environment and begin to reshift the paradigm, or shift the paradigm in my life of how I'm going to live and what sort of balance I want to maintain and what sort of simplicity I want to maintain. We hear a lot of people talking about decluttering. I don't know how many of you maybe have your homes full of, full of stuff. Maybe you have storage lockers that you rent to keep your stuff in. If you've ever heard the comedian George Carlin talks about stuff and how we get cars to tote our stuff around and, and we need bigger houses to keep more stuff. And then when we go on vacation somewhere, we pack stuff in our suitcases and we carry that stuff into our hotels. And then when we go on a day trip, we take the stuff out of our suitcase and put it in our backpack. And we're constantly carrying our stuff. I've tried to go through my stuff. And living in Pakistan with so many people who don't have stuff has opened my eyes to just how much stuff I've got. Things I've tried to do is to make sure that I don't have duplicate things in my home. You know, how many, you don't need three teapots. You don't need, you know, 12 pairs of shoes. Understanding needs and wants is a, probably a better way to, to, to start off by saying, going through your home and asking yourself, what are the things I need and what are the things I want? And if there's things you want that you don't need, that's fine too. But to be conscious of that is a very important thing. Um, assessing needs to discern what, um, what you can creatively do to meet those needs without having to purchase the need. Uh, what I mean by that is we might say, well, I need this. It's very important that I have this in my when I need this. Well, maybe, but is there a way that you could achieve um, the same goal without having to go purchase another one. For example, I need a new shovel. Well, why do you need a new shovel? Well, because my shovel's broken. Can you fix it? Well, no, I don't know how. Have you tried? No. Well, then let's start there. And so in our home, we've, we've really tried to foster with our daughters this idea of repairing things. We hear about reducing, reusing, recycling, but we don't often hear about repurposing and repairing. So my daughters know when something breaks, the first thing they do, bring it to Davy because we have a workshop at home and we'll try to fix it, which is leading to the next step, which is that we try not to purchase things made of plastic. We try um, to only purchase things made of wood or glass or metal, tin, brass, so that we can more easily fix these things when they get broken, because it's very easy to fix things that are made of wood when they break or steel or metal or glass. 
But you can't fix plastic. Once it's gone, it's in the recycling bin. It's over. It's done with. And there's a lot of people around the world who share this philosophy. Anybody who's got their children in a Montessori school, you'll know that the schools, the furniture, is wood. There's something about having something natural that Allah's created in the home. So we've, we've tried to, to stick to that. Be tactile in our lives to find some simplicity. Tactile, I don't mean this. I mean using our hands for more in our lives. Use your own hands to cook your own food. Use your own hands to grow things. Use your hands to build things, to fix things, to sew things, to stitch things, to pass on those trades to our children. It's so important because in our world, we've stopped becoming producers. We've stopped becoming people that use our senses of touch. We use our eyes constantly. Constantly we're using our eyes. And we're using our ears constantly. We're using our mouths constantly, shoveling food in and spewing rubbish out like I'm doing right now. But how often do we use our hands, right? Famous singer Pete Seeger says, the only thing you need to learn to play the guitar is an educated thumb. Well, a lot of us have educated thumbs. I've seen young people just type like mad. But it goes nowhere. It goes into the cyberspace. Use your fingers. Learn to drum. Learn to, to, to sand wood. Learn to, to knead dough. When you use your hands, and there's a connection between your brain and your hands, you see that simple beauty of working to do something that Allah has given you, given all of us, the ability to do. Um, so not just be a consumer, to be, to be a producer. In the last few minutes I've, I've got left, I just want to share with you some more things that I've been trying to do in my own life. And again, I take things to extremes because uh, I know that it's so easy to get sucked into other ways of life where you convince yourself that you need this, you need that. I need that cell phone. I need the upgrade cell phone. We've got so many smartphones and so many dumb people in the world. It's just insane. And we need to begin to take a step back and look, as we did around this room, and ask ourselves, what do I have in my house that has been created by Allah, a natural environment? Are my rugs made of plastic? Are my cupboards made of plastic and my tables and my chairs and the Quranic ayah on the wall? Why not begin to go through our home and start to sub substitute things in our home for things that are more natural and simple? One of the things that I love about Muslim artists through history and, and not just Muslim artisans, but artisans in, very, in all different folk cultures, is that for people who, who don't have money, um, but still need pots, to, plates to eat on, and rugs to, to cover their floors with, there was always a trend in folk art that your, your artworks become functional. As I said in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the functionality of things in creation, and then also talks about their beauty. And this is why you see throughout history and throughout various different cultures of the world that in places like Morocco you see beautiful pottery. It's used to eat on, but it's beautiful. Ceramic tiling, right? You can, you can go out and get, you know, plastic to cover your walls with if you want to go to Home Depot and get all your vinyl siding and vinyl doors and all those expensive, you know, faux blinds and vinyl plastic flooring. Great, wonderful, but why not try to go to something more natural that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created? Things that are functional and beautiful. Um, and this also helps to declutter your home. Instead of having to fill your home with, with things that are just pointless aesthetic things you buy at HomeSense or at Home Depot or whatever, why not fill your home with things that are functional and beautiful? It declutters and it simplifies your home so much more beautifully. And the things that are there that you use on a regular basis are things that then become very beautiful and personal to you. I've taken this to an extreme in my home, looking around my home after living in northern Pakistan for so long and seeing uh, what little my friends live on there. Moving back to Canada, it, it hurts me when I go to the store and I have to think about spending money, you know, uh, on groceries that would be two months' salary for a friend of mine in Pakistan. I try to, to really look at my own life, look at the clothing that I wear and the house that I have. As I mentioned, we substitute things in our house. We don't buy it. We try not to buy plastic at all. And if I buy a jar of relish, I'll buy the jar of relish that's in a glass jar because that glass jar can be reused if I need to put nuts and bolts in it in my workshop or rubber bands or my daughter's beads for their bracelets that they make. Repurpose things in your home and everything you bring into your house, ask yourself, what am I going to do with this when the contents is finished? Because in Pakistan, we have no garbage collection, as I mentioned. So when I buy something at the grocery store, I know that if that, that jar of, of mayonnaise is finished in a month and a half, it's going to go over the wall into the, the, the the rubbish that just people have thrown into a big pile and wait for someone to come around and set fire to every week or two. So I decide to keep these jars and reuse them. 
Make functional things in your home decorative. That's what we've tried to do in our home, where we try to focus on minimizing how much we've got and whatever we do have left that we have is something we love, we enjoy it, we use it, it's functional. We repurpose um, a lot of the trash in our home. A lot of people here, I say, yeah, but you know, we can recycle here. Mashallah, Ontario recycles. To me, that does not mean we should be able to go out to you know, Costco and buy water bottles in bulk and, and just chuck them in the bin every week. I mean, that, that doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of trying to minimize the amount of waste that we put into the world. It's akin to saying, well, we've got lots of energy in Canada, so we can turn the air conditioning on and leave the windows open. Well, you can, but why would you do that when Allah says in the Quran that, you know, wasting is a, a blatant sin, that Allah is, is against, you know, those or not with those who waste. Unplug is another one. Spending time each day with your family. Spending time reading, walking, writing, singing, playing, cooking, planting. I mean, the list goes on, but so often we're so... Um, connected and plugged in all the time. We can't imagine what our lives would be like without electricity. It's a really beautiful experience. My 10-year plan gets really extreme. In the last minute I've got left, you know, I, I try to, uh, I've made a plan for myself that I won't buy any more books, I won't buy any more CDs, I don't buy DVDs, I won't buy any more clothing. I gave myself from the age of 40 to the age of 50 to just wear the clothing that I've got because People in the world who don't have any clothing, if even the Prophet Sallallahu stitched his own clothing, who am I to just say, oh, the shirt doesn't fit anymore, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go buy another. So if I must buy clothing, I'll buy reused clothing. But uh, I've got myself down, I've got eight years to go, and I'm, I'm wearing shoes that my father got when he was on the fire department. I got those when I was 15. I just had them resold last year. I'm wearing this jacket that was in my, uh, my wife's grandfather's closet. And um, I'm proud of the fact that I think we can live on a lot less and save a lot more that can be used to help a lot more people, to bring a lot more balance into this world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. When it comes to my music, that's not my career. I don't really feel comfortable selling my music commercially. Uh, I write music because I can't afford a therapist and uh, it doesn't feel right selling that music to other people. So the music that you buy, uh, my songs, the nasheed that I've written over the years, that all goes towards a school in Pakistan that my wife's family and I are very passionate about and support. And, um, and what is my job? My job is to try to live in balance as best I can and write about that experience. And uh, every once in a while I'm asked to come and share some of these experiences with people like yourselves or sing songs about it. And uh, I'll keep doing that as long as people want to hear those stories and, and hear these ideas. And, and if the day comes when the songs become passe and the ideas seem obsolete from an old man, then I'll be happy to stay at home with my bees and farm tomatoes and uh, hopefully, God willing, find that simplicity that I've been seeking all my life. So Jazakum Allah Khairan. Thank you so much for giving me your attention today and your patience. Thank you so much for our friends who are, are translating today and I hope that I have not made it too difficult for you. But thank you so much for, uh, for being able to translate and make these, these talks and these lectures accessible to even more members of our community. And God bless you. Thank you. Jazakallah khair and salam alaikum.